safe one of the planet. Dr. Edgar Mitchell says there is a worldwide conspiracy to cover up. Edgar Mitchell is near a Roswell. Edgar Mitchell is hitting the limelight. Dr. Mitchell, 77 years old, was on a radio interview in Birmingham, England. I mean, you realize this is the story of the century. I mean, that's better than a little bit of water on Mars. The UFO phenomenon is real. Whoa! Former NASA astronaut Edgar Mitchell talking to the completely overwhelmed and astonished Nick Margerison on a little-known British station, Kerrang Radio. There's not much question at all what there's life throughout the universe. We're not alone in the universe. It is a real phenomenon. Astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell was on a radio show over in England, and he says that for six decades the government's been covering up the fact that aliens do exist. Petit homme vert, et pour cause, les extraterrestres ne sont plus sur la Lune, mais ici, sur Terre, et depuis longtemps. A group of space enthusiasts are pushing President Obama to release government documents on possible close encounters with aliens and UFOs. Jim Acosta has the story. To believers in UFOs, the truth isn't out there, it's in there. So they're calling on President Obama to end what they insist is a government cover-up of the existence of extraterrestrials. Will you release these records? Will you release all documents? Documents they claim exist and prove there is life in outer space. President Obama is awfully busy these days. I know he, think is. he has time for this. Well, let's say I would say the fact that we are not alone in the universe is one of the more important aspects of our time. Former Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, told the National Press Club he's convinced. But there isn't convincing proof that's going to convince the entire world at this that point. That is correct. That is what As we're As for John Podesta, he's still sticking to his belief that the government knows more than it's telling about UFOs. He released a statement saying the government should open the files and the American people can handle the truth. For years, the U.S. government has had a standing policy. It would neither confirm nor deny the existence of UFOs. Their non-cooperation has been interpreted by many ufologists as evidence of a government conspiracy to cover up UFO sightings. Now, sightings has uncovered information that provides another explanation for their silence. Many UFO sightings may actually be top-secret military aircraft the government doesn't want you to know about. When I first saw the UFO, it was directly overhead, moving incredibly slowly. The shape of it was half a triangle. And all of a sudden, over the hill, this enormous pattern of lights emerges. I was just in awe of what I'd seen because I didn't know what it was and I'd never seen anything like it. Holy cow! There's no question that there have been sightings by military devices in space. And that gets us right to the UFO question. Are we dealing with a cosmic water gate? Which I maintain that we are. What the hell was that? I don't know. <laughs> it was me. It was like leaving stuff behind it, wasn't it? For the past 25 years, the United States government, especially the Air Force, has been telling us these things don't exist. I, I feel that there's been so much controversy about cover-ups and UFO phenomena and everything that goes on and I think that someone needs to point out that a lot of it is just hogwash. If anybody says the United States government is not withholding information about flying science, just simply isn't telling the truth or they're totally ignorant one way or the other. Our most recent investigation has concentrated on a series of sightings in the western United States. Sightings has learned that many UFOs spotted in California and Nevada may actually be highly classified military experiments called black projects. Sources familiar with these black projects, many of whom wish to remain anonymous, have told us that the military is now experimenting with aerospace technology beyond our wildest dreams. The objects we're talking about are zipping around and doing hard angled turns, acute angled turns. In order to do that, it must be controlling gravity. And therefore, what you're talking about is a spacecraft, not an aircraft. I think you have to be careful not to confuse what's mysterious uh, with what is virtually supernatural. Certainly some of these things are going to look very strange, they're very unlike 
aircraft with which people are familiar. Well, certainly the history of the uh, flying saucer phenomena suggests that in the past, classified programs resulted in a lot of reports of flying saucers. And if you see all of the instances where conventional aircraft have been misinterpreted as flying saucers, it's quite easy to understand how unconventional aircraft could receive a similar misinterpretation. In the Nevada desert, we have things that would make George Lucas envious. We have things out there that are, that are literally out of this world. Most aeronautical black projects reportedly operate out of this test site located at Groom Lake in Nevada. This installation is also known as Area 51, or Dreamland. The government denies the very existence of Area 51, but these photographs do prove there is an installation at Groom Lake. They have a hangar near the south end of the ramp that appears to have doors that are almost 200 feet tall. Uh, 400 feet wide. You can put anything in there. One of the problems associated with Groom Lake is the fact that it is a place that not, does not officially exist. This federal official insisted on hiding his identity. Area 51 is the most tightly secured installation in this country. It's guarded both over the air and on the ground by elite Air Force security police and Department of Energy special response teams. They're heavily armed and their total mission is to keep people off of this installation. It's an ideal place for top secret, highly classified military projects to refine them, to take them to the next level. This is the place. You have deep, deep desert valleys, high mountain ranges to camouflage and mask these things when they fly. Uh, the military is the top dog here in Nevada, no doubt about it. They run the show. If someone came to me and said there's just absolutely nothing that secret and they decided they were going to hike into Area 51, I think that could be the biggest and perhaps the last mistake they are going to make in their life. Are these people still locked into a Cold War mentality? Is, is that the point here? Or are they really hiding something that's, that's totally alien? Is, is this otherworldly technology? that's being applied to Air Force black projects. One of the most recent black projects to be leaked to the media has been dubbed Aurora. The few facts revealed so far about Aurora's speed and maneuverability are tantalizing. Rumors about Aurora first started after thousands of people in Southern California reported feeling earthquakes. Seismologists found that the tremors were not earthquakes, but were caused by sonic booms. The booms were the first hard evidence that high-speed, unidentified aircraft were operating over the western United States. We really can't tell what's moving. The only thing we see is, is a sonic boom and that's telling us that something is moving faster than the speed of sound. So actually we can't even tell it's an airplane. The sonic booms were tracked and found to be heading toward Nevada. At the same time, witnesses described an increasing number of UFOs that defied the laws of aerodynamics. If they are top-secret military aircraft, where is this new technology coming from? The technology is, is incredible. A Mach 6 airplane, an uh, 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 unmanned aerial vehicle performing these incredibly banked high-speed turns. It boggles the mind. Yeah, I think it, it could possibly be something otherworldly or, or at least borrowed alien technology. I don't put that beyond the realm. Top secret testing of experimental aircraft does provide a compelling explanation for many UFO sightings. But what about sightings which occur in remote areas far from military bases, or sightings in which eyewitnesses claim personal contact? Further investigation is needed to provide a more complete answer to the UFO question. The most controversial subject we investigate on sightings is alien abduction. More and more seemingly credible people are coming forward, claiming that they've been abducted probed and manipulated by aliens. And now there's a new pattern developing. Supposed abductees are returning from their experiences with a cautionary message for us all. There's a new frightening chapter in the abduction story. Many abductees are claiming that their alien captors sent them home with apocalyptic predictions about life on Earth. It's a terrifying conclusion to an already horrible ordeal. I'm on my back on the bed, and she's at the foot of, of my bed, and she's doing something to me. He had this flashback of being on this table, being surrounded by these beings. I don't know what she was doing. She had some sort of an instrument in her hand. Little gray guys, big dark eyes, and one of them's putting a needle in my neck. 
Until recently, the story would end there. But now abductees are returning with more than horror stories. They feel they are intergalactic messengers who must deliver dire predictions. This new mission intrigues Harvard professor John Mack. This Pulitzer Prize winning psychiatrist at Cambridge Hospital is now treating people he calls experiencers. In his new book, Abduction, Mack presents 13 case histories. I thought this is crazy. I mean, I thought this is not possible. I've seen many, many cases and worked for two years before I said, look, there's a mystery here. I can't explain this. There's something like what they're saying seems to be happening to them. You actually have seen them in your room at, in bright sun daylight. What did you see? Currently working with over 100 patients, Dr. Mack's clinical approach gives abductees a chance to talk openly about their experiences. <laughs> I would have experiences that were so real, that were so lucid, they were every bit as real as me talking to you now, and yet I would dismiss them because they were so out of context. Joe is a successful businessman from Massachusetts who's had abduction memories since early childhood. He kept these experiences to himself until hearing about Dr. Mack's study. His abduction history is outlined in Mack's book. It's a detailed chronicle of otherworldly control and painful medical experimentation. They put something uh, up my nose and uh, it was very disarming and yet there's that sense of almost a split self because there's a part of me that's terrified and doesn't understand and yet there's this other part of me that they've already explained the procedure to and why. Over time, Joe's abduction experiences have changed. In an extraterrestrial version of the Stockholm Syndrome, he has less fear and has begun identifying with his captors. Once they begin to come to terms with their terror of, of the trauma, the experience tends to transform. They feel they're somehow connected with these beings, and they experience the beings themselves as closer to the source, which is a term they use very often, or home. It was the most profound experience of my life. But that kind of profound transformation does not happen in every case. The first being that I ever saw consciously in my entire life was sitting right here. Diane, a software test engineer, is also a patient of Dr. Max. She's documenting her encounters with these watercolor pictures. Um, this picture was in the fall of 92. It took place here in the house, and I woke up, started to pivot around, found I couldn't move, and, and something released, and I said I could move. I scanned the room, just about to give up, and I see a small gray female being sitting there just waiting for me to spot her and then she i don't know whether she flew or what but she sure came across the bed fast right up to my face and steered right like this although the the, the experiences don't fit our notions of reality there's nothing no reason to believe that that they're not telling the truth or that something occurred to them that uh, is real and they're telling it truthfully to corroborate these personal beliefs, Dr. Max searches for parallels among abduction stories. The most common thread, and ironically the most extraordinary, involves reproductive experiments. Sperm samples taken from the men by a cup put, it, put over the penis, some kind of vibratory energy that, that causes an ejaculation. Eggs taken from the women. Something is done between the egg and the sperm, which may be re-implanted in the woman in a subsequent abduction. Then that will be taken, for the fetus will be taken from them at a later time. That's their experience. I uh, flew out the window like a sucking vacuumed out feeling with all the air pushed out of me. I ended up on a craft laying down on a table and next thing I know I see a child one of those ugly little gray things is holding a child up and I said no that didn't come out of me at the end of that experience I I blacked out and came to standing on this platform and I was not home anymore I was somewhere else I don't know where this was I felt like I was on a ship 
the emotion is so appropriate to a real experience. Dreams don't operate like that. Fantasies and like that. Uh, trauma displaced from some of the sources and like that. It isn't just a traumatic story. It's a complicated, consistent narrative that operates clinically altogether like a real experience. The complicated, consistent narrative Dr. Mack's patients describe always has a beginning, middle, and most recently, the same exact ending. Before they are returned home, the abductees are warned about an impending apocalypse, unless all people on Earth drastically change their way of thinking. We are told that the human experience, the human race uh, as we have known it, is becoming or soon to be non-viable, not extinct. It, it can't survive. My own sense of it, and this is uh, purely speculative, is that we are also being given a choice to change our ways. In other words, we were here to shepherd or steward the earth, or, um, be responsible for a higher consciousness, and what we've become so far from the Creator, so distant from the source, that we have treated the earth like it was our property, and we are apparently a malignancy at a cosmic level now. The message is, wake up, grow up, the sandbox that you're littering is not your own, that you are not alone, that you don't need to feel the sense of isolation and separation that you have felt, that you're part of a bigger community. According to a recent Roper poll, one in 50 American adults exhibits at least four out of the five most common symptoms reported by alien abductees. That's a staggering statistic because it seems to indicate that 2% of our adult population is experiencing something for which no one has a conclusive explanation. The variety of witnesses of UFOs is endless. They include military personnel from the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, radar specialists, aeronautical engineers, airport traffic controllers, astronomers, FBI agents, state, county, and city police, pilots and crews from American, United, Eastern, Pan American, Northwest, Western, and TWA were also on the list of witnesses. Millions in the United Kingdom, France, Australia, South America, Mexico, and other nations around the world have seen UFOs. For 18 years, the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek headed up the Air Force investigation into UFOs called Project Blue Book and was acknowledged to be the world's foremost authority on UFOs. After amassing a computer bank of over 63,000 sightings, he states, The UFO phenomenon is truly a phenomenon of our times. It is an extremely puzzling one and calls forth a wide spectrum of opinions. No matter what one may think about UFOs, no matter what one may believe about them, whether it is all nonsense or whether they represent something very, very real, three facts stand out, three facts which no one can deny. The first is that UFO reports exist. Secondly, that UFO reports come from all over the world. And the third is that many are made by highly responsible people, often scientifically trained. We scientists have no positive proof yet of the origin or even of the reality of these strange reported craft. But we do know that the reports themselves are very real. To find the answer to this magnificent scientific puzzle, the UFO phenomenon, we need to approach it with a truly open mind so we can explore all possible avenues of explanation. One of the greatest waves of UFO sightings in modern history came in 1965, with more than 500 cases reported during the summer months alone. One such case was near Ann Arbor, Michigan, where 50 people and 12 police officers in three counties reported having seen objects flashing across the pre-dawn skies. That evening, 87 female students at Hillsdale College near Ann Arbor watched an object flying around and flashing bright lights for a period of about four hours. Life magazine said, call them what you will. Flying saucers, unidentified flying objects or optical illusions, they are back again and seen by more people than ever before. Last week, the manifestation seemed almost to have reached the proportions of an invasion. On the evening of October 25th, 1973, 
a young Pennsylvania farmer, Stephen Pulaski, and at least 15 other witnesses saw a bright object hovering over a field near them. Stephen grabbed his rifle and went to investigate. It was then that he noticed something walking along by the fence. They were hairy and long-armed, with greenish-yellow eyes, and a smell like burning rubber was present. Stephen sensed that these creatures were not friendly and fired a tracer bullet over their heads. And when they kept on coming, he fired directly at one of them. The creatures then all disappeared into the woods, and the glowing object disappeared from the field instantaneously. UFO researchers, as well as a state trooper, were called in to investigate. When they arrived, the people there told them that Stephen had been growling like an animal and flailing his arms. His own dog ran toward him, and Stephen attacked the dog. Stephen then collapsed, and after a time, began to come to his senses. The entire group commented, on the nauseating, sulfur-like odor that was present. The Amityville Horror was based on a factual account of what happened to a family in Amityville, New York. An irritating and nauseating odor seemed to accompany the presence of the ghost or spirit entity that entered there from time to time. Whitley Stryber wrote of his abduction experiences in his book, Communion. He said he could smell their presence and that it smelled like sulfur. Sometimes, I mean, if it didn't do that, then it wouldn't be a nightmare, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, what else? Uh... On October 11th, 1973, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker were fishing when a strange craft descended and hovered near them. Parker passed out, and Hickson was paralyzed, but was able to continue observing what was happening. Two entities then emerged from the craft and picked Hickson up by his arms and carried him inside the ship, where he was thoroughly examined. 
He was then taken back to where they had been fishing on the riverbank. When the two fishermen went to the sheriff's office to report their story, they were interrogated and then left alone in a room with a hidden microphone. The recording of their conversation revealed that both men were quite frightened by their experience. The emotional trauma had been so great to Parker that after Hickson left the room, he began to pray. Ultimately, he suffered a nervous breakdown as a result of his experience. In the spring of 1959, UFOs brought panic to Soviet radar and Air Force personnel by hovering and circling for more than 24 hours above Zverdlovak, headquarters of a tactical missile command. Red fighter pilots were ordered airborne to chase the UFOs away, but later reported that the alien objects easily outmaneuvered their jets and zigzagged to avoid their machine gun fire. The Russian spacecraft Zalyut 6 returned to Earth in 1978 after 96 days in orbit. They told of a formation of UFOs which trailed them closely for three complete orbits around the globe. One of their cameras captured 20 minutes of incredible motion picture footage of this encounter. According to a previous mutual agreement, the Russians forwarded copies of the film to the United States to be analyzed. Unofficial statements from NASA state that it is the best motion picture footage ever filmed of UFOs. The foremost Russian authority on UFOs, Dr. Felix Zeigel, contends that UFOs may have frightened, harassed, and possibly even killed Russian cosmonauts on their missions. A top scientist, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, conducted a five-year study of 82 persons who reported UFO experiences. Most of them were able to relive the experience through hypnosis, and all suffered severe psychological disturbances afterwards. They claimed to have been taken inside spaceships and examined by humanoids who communicated telepathic messages to them. In his book, Secrets of the UFOs, ufologist Don Elkins made the following observation. I have found that some people can achieve the contact phenomenon simply by being hypnotized and the same general message permeates over 90% of the millions of words received by thousands of people around the world. No one knows what hypnosis is, no one knows what goes on in the mind. It's an altered state of consciousness like yogis and uh, witch doctors have been practicing. Uh, it loosens the normal connection between your spirit and your brain and of course if the hypnotist can control you, make all kinds of suggestions, make you think uh, things are happening that are not happening, make you think you have powers that you don't, experiences that you haven't, even implant memories. Uh, other beings, if there are other minds out there, they could also do the same thing. Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. What he means by that is your spirit operates your brain in a normal state of consciousness, in an altered state, reached under yoga, a TM, hypnosis. Uh, you have loosened the normal connection between your spirit and your brain, and that allows another spirit, other entities, other minds to interpose themselves and begin to tick off the neurons in your brain, create a, a universe of illusion. I believe that it's demonic. I think all of the evidence indicates this. Some people claim that by allowing themselves to be put into an hypnotic trance, they are acting as a channeling device in which the extraterrestrial being speaks through them. The following is an actual sampling of those messages. We come from the Interplanetary Confederation of Solar Systems, and our purpose is to aid our brother man on the planet Earth as the new age dawns. The teacher that was known to you as Jesus was able to use many more of the abilities than the people of this planet. Unfortunately, man upon planet Earth has misinterpreted the meaning of this man's life. He was no different from any of you. He was simply able to remember certain principles. He was simply able to remember certain principles. These principles may be realized by anyone at any time. It is only necessary that you avail yourself to our contact through meditation in order to begin to re-realize that which is rightfully yours, the truth of the creation 
and the truth of your position in it. Know ye not that ye are gods? We have been puzzled at times by the inability of the people in general of this planet to be awakened to this simple truth. We find that the state of hypnosis brought about by the evolution of thought of the people of this planet is so great that it is necessary for him to maintain a constant awareness of his spiritual nature with meditation. Man is now in the transitional period before the dawn of a new age. With peace, love, brotherhood and understanding on man's part, he will see a great new era begin to dawn. UFO researcher John Weldon then offers this question. How credible is it to think that literally thousands of genuine extraterrestrials would fly millions of light years simply to teach New Age philosophy, deny Christianity, and support the occult? And why would the entities actually possess and inhabit people just like demons do if they were really advanced extraterrestrials? Dr. Pierre Guerin an eminent scientist associated with the French National Council for Scientific Research concludes that UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it, and that modern UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. The word demon in Greek comes from the root meaning knowledge or intelligence, implying that demons have access to knowledge and information denied to ordinary mortals. After what happened to me, the communion experiences, I decided that that might be a good idea to accept the idea of the devil just in case that's what I saw. If you look closely at the life of the world, you see the workings of evil in the world. There seems to be a sort of a machinery behind it that is far beyond just the accident of human life. You can literally hypnotize a person, tell them that there's a cat in their lap, they will see it, they will hear it, purr, they will pet it and feel it. It's not physically there. You tell the cat to scratch them, you know, and bring them out of it, there are scratch marks on their cheek. A non-physical object under the right conditions can leave physical evidence. Uh, I think it's demonic. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a spiritual power of some kind for which there is no physical explanation. It, the, you can't explain it with the laws of chemistry and physics as we know it. John Keel is a world-renowned expert on UFOs and has written numerous books and articles on the subject. A self-described agnostic, he made this statement. Thousands of books have been written on the subject of demonology which is the ancient and scholarly study of monsters and demons. The manifestations and occurrences described in this literature are identical to the UFO phenomenon. Victims of demonic possession suffer from the same medical and emotional symptoms as the UFO contactees. I would say I was assaulted by something from the unknown rather than possessed by it. I, don't, I hope that I was never possessed by it, although there are those who might disagree with me. And uh, I don't think it was something out of craziness. If it came out of my mind, it came out of a part of my mind that uh, is universal to us all. Like Stryber, there are thousands of others who have also sensed something evil and demonic. Something is here, probing people, inspecting them, planting thoughts in their minds, and manipulating their bodies. I do know from different things that are still occurring within my body, that I'm still being visited. The United States Printing Office issued a 400-page publication entitled UFOs and Related Subjects, an Annotated Bibliography. The author was the senior bibliographer for the Library of Congress, Ms. Lynn E. Cato. During her research, she read over 1,000 articles, books, and other literature. She summarizes her findings in the preface of the bibliography. A large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist manifestations and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomena that have long been known to theologians and parapsychologists. 
This document was compiled for the United States Air Force and is now in the Library of Congress. Dr. Jacques Vallée has addressed the United Nations on UFOs and was the model for Lacombe in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He is the author of eight books on UFOs and has been widely recognized as the premier investigating scientist in the realm of UFO research. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Vallée says, an impressive parallel can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons. And in his book, Confrontations, he writes, The medical examinations to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. He also made this statement, I believe that when we speak of UFO sightings as instances of space visitations, we are looking at the phenomenon on the wrong level. We are not dealing with successive waves of visitations from space. We are dealing with a control system. And he states, UFOs are the means through which man's concepts are being rearranged. They are engaging in a worldwide enterprise of subliminal seduction. Jacques Vallée, is, at least at that time when he wrote that book, was an agnostic. Interesting that he comes to basically the same conclusions I do as a Christian from my research. And he said uh, about UFOs, they're real, but they're not physical. They're messengers of deception. And this was based on his research of about 20 years. They seem to be psychologically preparing, setting us up for some ultimate delusion that is too horrible even to imagine as yet. I would agree with that. Dr. I.D.E. Thomas is one of a long line of Welsh preachers. He is currently the senior pastor at the First Baptist Church of Maywood, California, and has authored several books which have enjoyed wide circulation. In his book, The Omega Conspiracy, Dr. Thomas explains the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and offers an explanation that could identify the beings who operate them. As incredible as his explanation may sound, let us regard the ancient saying of Heraclitus, who 500 years before Christ said, Because it is sometimes so unbelievable, the truth escapes becoming known. The answer to all this and the clue to this cosmic riddle may be found in the ancient book of Genesis. And back there in chapter 6, we are told of a very amazing and bizarre event. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and saw that they were beautiful and they lusted after them. And then we read they married them and sired children from them. For the past 1500 years, most scholars, including evangelical scholars, have interpreted the sons of God as the good sons of Seth and the daughters of men as the wicked daughters of Cain. They've adopted that interpretation because the other one is so bizarre and outlandish. The ancient interpretation, and in my opinion the correct one, is that the sons of God were demonic beings or fallen angels. And that they came down to earth, they lusted after the daughters of men, they married them, and produced this amazing progeny, this hybrid progeny of the Nephilim. And the very word Nephilim does not mean giants. It comes from the root Nephal, fallen ones. The early Christian fathers in the first four centuries, men like Irenaeus, Tertullian, Ambrose, for 400 years they knew no other interpretation except that the sons of God were angelic beings. Uh, Josephus, the cosmopolitan Jewish historian, says the same thing. We read in the book of Job that when God laid the foundation of the earth, the sons of God shouted for joy. Obviously the sons of God could not have not been created. If this was a case of just mixed marriages between good men and wicked women, it is surprising that God should have issued the fire of judgment that he did. God took this stern action 
of wiping out the human race. Now the only family that were left intact in order to re-establish, repopulate the new world was the family of Noah. Noah, we are told, was perfect in his generations. The word perfect does not mean, in this case, morally perfect. Because we know from the story of Noah, and especially what happened after the flood, that Noah was not perfect. Uh, what it means is, like a lamb uh, for the paschal sacrifice, that lamb had to be without blemish. Uh, physically pure, without blemish. So it seems was the case of Noah. The only family that remained uncontaminated from these strange beings that appeared from space. Uh, the only line that was pure and clean from God's standpoint to start a new world and a new civilization. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Of all the patriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament, the key to prophecy above all others is Noah. And something happened in the days of Noah that was a distinctive characteristic of Noah's time that didn't happen before or after. Wars and famines and pestilences and natural disasters have always happened. But something happened in the days of Noah and the most sinister and bizarre of all the things that happened was this intermarriage between the angelic race and the human race. And of course the mastermind behind it all was another angel, a fallen angel, Lucifer. Now we believe that as they came in those days, we may very well be on the edge of another invasion from outer space that Satan will once again make another attempt, maybe the final assault on the human race, in order to wean men and women away from the worship of God. He has tried before, he will inevitably try again. And by seducing the human race, by sending these so-called entities from space, demonic beings, he will try to get people all over the world to worship him and to deprive God of the worship that is due to him. Fortunately, we know what the end result is going to be. But this final or omega assault that will come at the end of time may trigger the coming back of Jesus Christ to rescue his own. Satan has failed before, and the Bible predicts he will fail again. wonder New Yorkers looked up and said, you'd be saying, oh my God, too, if you saw this shot in the sports section with the understated caption, under ominous skies, ominous. Shots came in from Harlem, shots came in from Chelsea. Remind you of anything? The alien's arrival in the movie Independence Day, at least New Yorkers didn't crash, they didn't flee. They did what any red-blooded New Yorker would do. They made home videos. Hey, you know, I gotta say, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. The scriptures must be fulfilled. And that means the prince of the power of the air will be cast down from heaven and will attempt to once and for all wrestle away control of the world from God and take it for his own wretched use. To the UFO enthusiasts, if you haven't yet stopped to consider not just merely what the nature of these beings are, but more to the point, their intentions, if you have not yet considered this at its core to be a spiritual question, then you have clearly rejected the relatively scant physical evidence that we have available to us. 
For these manifestations in the air are, up to this point, only that. Pope Benedict recently came out to assure all Catholics that it's okay to believe in space aliens, and they would be our, quote, brothers. But what the Pope is hoping for is that his followers will not ever set their eyes on the Word of God, for they would find a dire warning against this blasphemous and satanic lie that can be found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, where we are told that God would send forth a strong delusion, which would likely fool a vast majority of the world, educated and uneducated, God-fearing and atheist alike. My friends throughout the world, first I must thank the leaders of each of your countries who have graciously and in the interests of peace turned over all their broadcasting facilities to us to help avoid confusion in this crisis. Your national leaders have suggested that a state of martial law will be most helpful at this time, and we agree. The visitors are not our friends. They've come to rape our planet and kill us. They are not who they appear to be. Abduction is now a common theme in movies and television. According to a Roper poll in 2002, one in five Americans believe that abductions have taken place. For the so-called abductees, the memories of what they say they have experienced are deeply traumatic. At between six and eight, I would assume. Okay. They're fairly intense? Or? Yeah, they're very close together as well. Right, okay. Four years ago, Kelly Carr was a mother and housewife with no interest in spaceships or aliens. Now she's using technology to reconstruct images of her own encounter. It does give the idea of the lights there, but you know, the, the brightness of the light, it gives a good impression, except that the colour doesn't seem right. Kelly's account starts in August 1993. My husband and I were driving up to my girlfriend's place uh, in Mombok, which is in the Dandenong Mountains. We were driving on Belgrave Hallam Road, and it was just on dusk. I saw what I thought was round orange lights in the field. It didn't look unusual to me. Later that night, retracing their route home, Kelly noticed something else unusual. It's about a, a kilometre or so in front of us, uh, about twice the height of the tre treetops, we could see this um, uh, uh, object, which at first I thought was a blimp. It had the shape of a blimp, but it was light. As we got closer to it, the, the light seemed to sort of separate, and it was actually these uh, a row of round lights, uh, and they were orange. It appeared like there were silhouettes standing in these round orange circles, like people, but you could only see the black outline. Well, I just said to my husband, look, there's people in there. And the minute I said that, it shot off to the left of us. Within one or two seconds, it was gone completely. About a, a kilometre uh, or two further down the road, as we kept driving, I came across what, at least what I thought, was a screen or a wall of light across the road. And my heart started racing and the adrenaline was sort of pumping through my body and I'm thinking, we've just seen this back down there, we're, we're in for, you know, a close encounter. Then the next instant, nothing. We seem to have um, actually covered a fair distance that I don't even remember covering. It might have been possibly close to a kilometre, but I don't remember uh, actually travelling. <clears throat> there was no light, there was, you know, there was nothing blocking the road. Kelly says it wasn't until weeks later she remembered actually getting out of the car that night. And I saw that there was a, um, uh, another, car, another car that had pulled up a hundred metres down the road. Then I walked around the front of the car to where my husband was standing on the other side and uh, we started walking across the road together. 
as we were walking across the road, I looked down and I saw that the other people were getting out the car and starting to walk as well. So I was quite happy that there was other people there who were seeing the same thing that we were. And we walked up along here to, to um, where the fence is. Right out in front of us is this, this huge craft. I was totally awestruck, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was science fiction coming to life. There wasn't any fear then, it was just all, total awe. We stood here, I guess side by side, my husband and I, for about 30 to 45 seconds. Then this tall dark being just appeared in front of the craft and, and he was followed by about another seven or eight that appeared straight behind him. I felt this energy go through me. It's like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. It was like some sort of low level frequency that came in waves, but it was so dense that I could actually physically feel it going through my body. And that feeling absolutely terrified me. It was like, uh, I can't even explain the horror that I felt just feeling this. And um, I uh, began screaming. The minute I did, the eyes on these things lit up and they came charging across the field. Halfway across, they split up into two groups. Some headed off down there and the rest came directly towards us. I felt this blow to my stomach and the next thing you know, I'm back here somewhere on the grass. It literally lifted me off of my feet. And I thought I was going to die. I thought if I don't get up now, I'm never going to... I'm going to pass out and I'm going to die. I'm not going to come back to consciousness, you know. So I pulled myself up into a sitting position and when I sat up, I couldn't see anything. And uh, it was like there was just black in front of my eyes. I want you to try stretching it down a little bit as well. Kelly is not the only one who saw these images that night. For the first time ever, independent witnesses have given the same account of a close encounter. Even though Kelly has never met Jane, Glenda and Bill from the other car she saw, she has seen the sketches they drew for UFO researchers. They've drawn the same um, circles of light around the top of the craft with um, this, uh, these blue lines coming down ending in, in a semi-circle uh, on the ground. They've actually also drawn a tripod underneath which was something I didn't see that night. It comes very clear then that we were all looking at the same thing and that it wasn't your average um, saucer shaped uh, craft. And basically the second party were able to draw sketches of the beings very similar to the ones that I had and they're not your usual um, little grey things that are, you know, media propaganda. I found a small red coloured uh, equilateral triangle underneath my navel which I guess in reality provoked um, only a minor curiosity at the time. Uh, it was oddly geometric and I did, I did wonder, you know, how, how something like that could get on me uh, that looked like a burn without me feeling it. At UFO conferences where Kelly is now a keynote speaker, she adds strength to her own story by showing photographs of physical marks left on one of the other women. Last, we're all left with triangular marks under our navels, but um, the ones that were marks that were actually photographed, the first one came from Glenda, which is a, uh, it's a series of three small red dots along the inner thigh, and both Jane and Glenda um, were marked with these dots. I wasn't. Glenda had a, uh, a ligature mark around her ankle, which is quite severe bruising. Um, it looked like she'd been strapped down for something. UFO researchers have also reported finding physical traces of the site where all witnesses said the encounter happened, particularly in relation to where the craft landed. Inside that semicircle was actually a, um, a triangular formation of three points spaced six metres apart, which correspond with the tripod that was um, drawn underneath the, the girl's craft. To this day, Kelly still doesn't know exactly what happened to her that night. Try, try a little bit. Her most vivid memory is the fear that she felt. That's very good. It's finally come out to what I'm looking for. And I think a lot of people, you know, might have experienced the fear in a nightmare when you're being chased or something like that, and it's a terror that you feel that, you know, sometimes can wake you up or whatever, but it's absolutely horrifying when you're dreaming it. And that's exactly what I was feeling while I was totally awake. That sort of terror, actually having to feel it while you're um, conscious and physically awake and feel it as a reality is um, like a living nightmare, like, like a nightmare that comes to life.
When men began to multiply on the face of the land, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. There certainly have been sightings of ancient that may be embraced by ancient mythology. The idea that the modern sightings might have a relationship with the ancient Nephilim uh, events of the Old Testament is conjecture on the part of some of us as scholars, uh, but I think the, uh, it would seem to be consistent with the remarks of Jesus himself. As Jesus himself said, that as we get to the end times, he says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the Son of Man be. Now that, what he might mean by that is simply that it was business as usual until the judgment came, and that's what many scholars would, would, would uh, infer. But there are many scholars that believe the text implies even more than that. In order to understand what Jesus meant, we need to understand what the days of Noah were like. And clearly, the uh, sixth chapter of Genesis demonstrates that the purpose of the flood of Noah was to deal with what was in effect a gene pool problem. There isn't anybody who is predisposed to being abducted. The only thing is, is that their mother or their father must have been an abductee. And what that means is that they're abducted from the time they're infants all the way through until the time they're adults. And they're abducted in great frequency over and over and over again. So they usually talk about uh, uh, having sperm taken, having eggs taken, uh, harvested essentially. When women become older, they discuss fetal implantations where they, they suddenly realize they're pregnant. And I'll take an early pregnancy test and it shows positive, which of course can't be possible. And they'll go to their gynecologist who'll do a blood test, which is absolute, which is 100% uh, reliable. And the doctor will say, congratulations, you know, you're pregnant. And they think to themselves, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Doctors uh, invariably think pseudocyesis, uh, which would be hysterical pregnancy, when a person or a woman really, really, really wants a child and begins to fantasize it and even causes some sort of physiological reaction, uh, however, most people are not like that. They, some people have already had kids, they don't want any more. Uh, some are too young for you. You, know, there's, you have to have a certain sort of mental set to have pseudocyesis. Uh, or they think miscarriage. And for women, uh, they would say, well, you know, if I had a miscarriage, I think I would have noticed that. With fetal implantation, we get, of course, fetal extraction. When they are not pregnant, they will remember events that happen where a fetus is extracted from them. It's very, very small, but they'll know during the event that the fetus is being taken. But it happens to them so often, it's familiar. So we've seen these reproductive procedures quite a bit. In fact, it's, the, it's critical to the, to the abduction phenomenon. Without the reproductive aspects of it, there wouldn't be a, an abduction phenomenon. This is, this is the point of it. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Genesis 6, 3, and 4. The word Nephilim comes from the Hebrew verb Nephal, the fallen ones. They are the hybrid offspring of the Benaiah Elohim, the sons of God. It's a technical term Hebrew term used of angels, and uh, these fallen angels cohabited with human women and produced a, hy a hybrid offspring. It was part of Satan's strategy. This view of Genesis chapter 6 and all of that is not free of controversy today. However, that is the view that was embraced by the ancient Hebrew sages. That is the view that is substantiated by the ancient rabbinical writings. That is the view that was accepted by the early church. When the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek, the language is even more specific. And so uh, this idea that they were somehow just a leadership or sons of Adam or something were, were contrived arguments that emerged in the 5th century, so-called lines of Seth idea. Emerged in the 5th century, so-called lines of Seth idea. And that's still taught in many seminaries. The problem with it, it's not biblical. Because in the New Testament, it even confirms this. Both Peter and Jude make reference to this clearly talking about these angels that went after strange flesh, that abandoned their previous clothing, that disrobed from their previous existence to 
ind indulge in this, uh, what should I call it, chicanery. This event was echoed in mythologies everywhere as the age of the titans and demigods, the same way that the UFO phenomenon is echoed in our fiction. When we study the passage in Genesis 6, we'll notice that one of the distinctives of Noah was that his genealogy was unblemished. And the Hebrew word there is to mean, which is used of physical defects. In other words, one of the reasons that Noah was picked, probably many, but one was that one of his distinctives was that his genealogy wasn't contaminated by these goings on. It would appear that the strategy of Satan was to introduce this as a means of corrupting the human line to preclude God's plan of redemption through the Messiah, which had to be a kinsman of Adam. The parable of Jesus that I count as foundational for Satan and evil is the one where Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who owned a field and sowed good seed in it, had his servants go sow good seed in it, and then by night an enemy came and sowed weeds in the field and then went away. Well, the Nephilim in the book of Genesis, of course, are the hybrid offspring of these strange interludes between the fallen angels and the daughters of, of man, of, of Adam. And so they're hybrids, and uh, they are uh, very prominent in uh, the early chapters of Genesis, but they're also, the scripture says, occurred after that to some extent, right. but they're hybrids. As we study the passages in the Bible that describe what we call the end times, it's interesting that one of the characteristics that shows up in Daniel 2 is that it says they will mingle themselves with, with, with the seed of men. The prophetic dream of Nebuchadnezzar gives us an astonishing detail concerning end times. Scripture indicates that the last government of earth will be a hybrid government iron mixed with clay and where you saw iron mixed with merry clay they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not adhere to one another even as iron is not mixed with clay daniel 2:43 now in order for them to mingle with the seed of men the they have to be something other than the seed of men so it's just a hint but it's a profound hint that somehow in the end times there's going to be again some kind of commingling, some kind of intrusion into the genetic DNA makeup of people that's going to be a contaminant that will be part of the end times. And that's why there's so much scholastic interest in this UFO business, in the abduction narratives and, and reports. And we may very well be being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time of the Gospels, when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. When people are abducted, as part of the procedures, they will sometimes be taken into a room and they will see containers. And in each container, there's liquid, and in the middle of the liquid, there's a tiny fetus floating. Later, they'll be shown babies, small, odd-looking babies, as they will report. Their babies don't look right. Physically, they're phlegmatic. They're, they look like they're sick. They're not bouncing babies that are grasping and gurgling. They're silent. They, they, they almost look like they're half dead. They also have unusual features. People say they look like they're sort of half-human, half-alien. They're, they're, they're odd-looking, yet they look sort of human. Uh, my colleague Bart Hopkins says that they called them hybrids originally, and that's a name that's, that's stuck. They then will have to hold the baby, have some sort of physical contact with the baby, put their hand on the baby's stomach, hold the baby close to their skin. There must be skin-on-skin -skin contact. Oftentimes, when the baby's a little bit older, they're required to feed the baby. Sometimes they'll be brought into a room. This is now men and women where there will be what looks like two-year-olds, three-year-olds, one-and-a-half-year-olds walking around, and they are required to play with them, 
have contact with them and uh, we see these toddlers when they're four years old, five, seven years old, nine years old, they're already children, young children at that point. People describe them as adolescents, they describe them as young adults, they describe them as adults, and they don't describe them as older adults so much. By the time uh, we see them as adolescents, uh, we see them involved with the abduction phenomenon. Performing tasks, they have jobs to do, they're part of the, the world of abductions, uh, going about their business doing, doing what's required of them. So let's remember yeah. that when Jesus briefed four disciples in his confidential mm -hmm. briefing on his second coming, he opened his discussion and he closed his discussion with the urgent admonition, let no man deceive you. We need to understand that the characteristic of the period that we're being plunged into is one of deceit, one of very clever uh, uh, misguidance by the enemy. We do have an enemy. He's very knowledgeable, very resourceful. And we are moving into open spiritual warfare. We're used to conflicts in countries about politics, different views. Today, there's a fundamental war going on in world views. Sometimes, uh, abductees will be brought into a room and their attention will be directed at a screen-like device. And the person will hear a, uh, a voice in their mind saying, can you tell the difference between us and you? Now, depending on who the person is, they will say, what do you mean the difference between us and you? Everybody is the same. And they'll hear in their head, see? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? This pretty soon in the future, we will all be together. You won't be able to tell the difference, and it will be wonderful. Some will be able to tell the difference. Some would say, well, yes, this one here looks like you, and this one here looks like us. And at that point, they will say, well, you know, there will be a difference, but we will all be together, and, and, and you're one of the lucky ones. You can tell the difference. Most people won't be able to. The key fact here is that they are saying, in the future we'll all be together. As you follow the progress through the centuries and you see how uh, the power structures have changed, it has been going more and more towards an economical power structure uh, to control the world with, uh, uh, with money. And that seems to be where it's going. Uh, more and more we're looking towards a world uh, bank, one world system, one world currency. I mean, already Europe has joined its currency together. Americans, North Americans are thinking the same way. So this is really the work of Satan. This is his way of getting command and control over the entire world. As we deal with the end time scenario in the Bible, one of the dominant players is a world leader in fact, it's two guys working together, but it's a, a world leader that is going to successfully unite the world into a one world religion. He's going to exalt himself above all that is called God, that includes Allah as well as the Jews and the Christians. He somehow is going to deceive the whole world. He's the most popular guy that's ever come along. There are experts that have studied the scripture that believe that he could very well have an alien connection or even be one himself. The uh, involvement of these alien entities may be a far bigger factor in the climax uh, that the Bible portrays than most classical scholars have really uh, been sensitive to. Seven, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I don't know what it was, but it, it just overthrew like like a couple of hundred feet above us. Like, like, you know, I don't know if it was a rocket or whatever, but incredibly fast, uh, opposite direction. In the opposite direction? Yes, sir. At the time was what two one zero seven. It was it was too fast to be an airplane. Okay, thank you. It's in ninety six Boston Center. The center maintain flight level one eight. Okay, thank you. It's in 96 Boston Center. The center maintain flight level 180. Down to 180, yes, sir. 986. It's in 96. You see anything uh, like a missile in your area, perhaps off to your right? 
take a good look, but I don't think if it's going that fast, I probably won't get a chance. We just saw Swift there go by a little bit. We found a phenomenon that is global, that is random, that is intergenerational, and that happens in great frequency, something we never expected to see, uh, that is goal-directed, that is done clandestinely, secretly, and that has as its goal ultimately an integration into the society on their terms, not on our terms. And I think that there's not a lot we can do about it, unfortunately. You know, it's interesting that in the book of Genesis, the very first prediction of Jesus Christ is when God declares war on Satan, Genesis chapter 3, and he speaks that the ultimate redemption of man will come from the seed of a woman, and there is even a hint of the virgin birth. But that phrase is actually a contradiction in biology as well as grammar, but that's the term used. But most people overlook in that very verse, he also speaks of the seed of the serpent. And so it's clear that Satan has a role in this final climax that we're all heading to. What we think is going on here, because eggs are taken and sperm is taken, that they are joined together in vitro. They are joined together outside, and at that point, Either DNA is added, or the fertilized egg is altered in some way. And when that happens, we posited that you're going to get a bell-shaped curve, that some are going to look really alien, some are going to look really human, and most are going to be in the middle. What we've also learned is that what they then do is take the DNA from one of these hybrid children and inject that into the embryo. And then you get a skewed bell-shaped curve where some of them look alien, a lot look in the middle, and a lot more look a lot more human. Then you take DNA from that generation and do the same thing. And you keep doing it over and over and over again until pretty soon you get hybrids that look very human. There's slight differences, but very human. And that is, in fact, what we have been seeing, much to our amazement and uh, chagrin. But in contrast to stories from the ancient world, which produced giants, sexual contact between aliens and humans is absent. Perhaps this time a different strategy is at hand. I now believe that this is a kind of integration program into the society. As a program, it is being done for a reason. It is goal-directed. It had a beginning, a middle, and it's got an end. They are doing this for a reason. That's critically important to understand. Not only that, this is clandestine. It is secret, and it is secret for a reason. I've been involved with studying UFOs and abductions for over 40 years and it was always kind of thrilling and exciting. Now it's depressing and fearful uh, and it's not something that I enjoy hearing. As an academic, you're required to examine that data to see whether it's true or not and if it is true, to go where the evidence leads you, even though you might kick and scream while en route. And I have kicked and screamed en route. But as an honest academic, you're required to do that. And as a historian, you're required to do that especially. And that is where it has led me. And it has led me into areas that I, I don't want to go. Not only that, it's embarrassing to talk about this. I understand how completely insane it sounds. I am fully aware of my words of what I'm saying. And, and the effect that this has on people, oh, this is just nuts. And, and I, I understand that. But in order to be academically honest, I must say it nonetheless, even though it puts me in a very bad position.
I just wish that other people in the scientific community would at least learn a methodology of studying this phenomenon. They haven't done that and it's not going to happen from what I can tell. I mean, I can't tell the future, but the chances of that happening are very remote now because we have looked at every conceivable kind of psychological explanation and none of them are I am waiting for the coming of Christ. I believe he is coming in ships, right? and that he will come and collect us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 This prophesied collecting event could be understood as a mass abduction. Satan and his chosen hybrid may villainize the coming Messiah and deceive the world they rule by misrepresenting him. Concerning the world leader, Scripture states, Some of the passages that puzzle me the most in the Scripture it describes that the whole world is going to go to war against God. Now, I can understand the world rejecting God, I can understand the world not believing God, but somehow it's always been hard for me to visualize the world mustering its resources to go to war against God. That all, and yet that's clearly what it says in Psalm 2 and a number of other places. But you know, suddenly I can begin to understand how this might happen, because there are many people that believe that there are already aliens among us conspiring with the government, whatever, and they visualize these as being the good guys. They're here to help us. They're here to give us advanced technology. They're people that really have this kind of attitude. One of the other procedures that people describe is a certain kind of staring procedure. Uh, where a person will say that, that they're being looked at, and I'll say, well, well, what do you mean being looked at? Do you mean they're just looking you over, you know? I'll say, no, no, he's, he's, uh, he's looking at me very closely, and I say, well, where is he looking? Is he looking? These are purposely misleading questions. Is he looking at your abdomen? Is he looking at your stomach? Is he looking at your knees? You know, where is he looking? No, no, he's looking at my face. I say, well, is he looking at, you mean your chin? He's looking at your chin? No, no, he's looking at my eyes. And I'll say, well, how far away is he from you? Oh, his forehead is touching mine. I'll say, well, can you close your eyes? No. Can you look away? No. And they're being stared at at a distance of maybe an inch, two inches, sometimes forehead touching forehead. What this is, is some sort of neural engagement. And people can, f can see and, and imagine things that, that are going on in their brain, but they, they can almost understand where the, which neurons are being innervated as they're hooking into the optic nerve and using that as a conduit to go into other neural pathways and innervate specific anatomical sites within the brain. People see images in their mind when this happens. They will see images of horrible events, catastrophic events happening. Uh, the earth breaking in two, uh, nuclear war, a, a meteor hitting in this imaging that they're going through. They will have a job to do or tasks to do. Now, the reason I could think this is because there were other kind of neurological events that were happening to them that they kept describing these where they would have to sit at a council and 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 perform certain tasks almost electronically or with their or have to do something with their eyes they would have to um, uh, look at a specific situation and change it with their eyes or there were all sorts of things that they had to do all of which had something to do with neurology their eyes, or there were all sorts of things that they had to do, all of which had something to do with neurology.
I can begin to see uh, a, a scenario which we sometimes call good cop, bad cop kind of thing, where, the, where Satan's emissaries pose to be our friends to help prepare us for the bad guys who are coming. And, and uh, I can visualize the whole world being deceived in taking up arms against God, thinking that they're being led by their friends who are actually Satan's emissaries. Eventually, they began to talk about how in the future they would have these certain tasks to perform and they had to make sure that, that they performed these correctly. And we began to realize that from the time they were children all the way up through adults, they were being trained over and over again to obey eventually uh, the signal when it was given for them to, to do certain tasks that they had to perform in the future. Uh, there are passages in the book of Revelation which describe spirits like frogs that lead the whole world to the battle of the mind. And I, I, I suddenly can, in my imagination at least, visualize a scenario where these beings, if they become prevalent enough and powerful enough and accepted enough by the culture, getting the culture and take up arms against the second And that could be the Bible not so seems The big lie, I think, that's coming is that Satan has got to fool the world, he's got to lie to the world, he's got to make them believe that the one who is coming, Christ, the Son of God, is, is some sort of alien invader who is coming to take over the world. Uh, and so uh, making him seem like an, uh, like an alien invader will make it very easy to get the uh, armies of the world and the governments of the world in line to defend the world against such an invasion. Our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Why would the armies of the world fight Christ when he came, right? Well, they had to be, number one, fighting for Satan against Christ. So Satan has got to fool the world, he's got to lie to the world, got to make them believe that the one who is coming, Christ, the Son of God, is, is some sort of alien invader who is coming to take over the world. And so making him seem like an, like an alien invader will make it very easy to get the uh, armies of the world and the governments of the world in line to defend the world against such an invader. So this is one possibility, I think, that uh, it's coming. Fire, seven, go ahead. Approaching at 10 o'clock high. This is Houston. Say again, seven. This is the Valley of Megiddo, north of Jerusalem, where good is to triumph over evil in the final battle of this cosmic war. The prophesied kingdom of the Messiah will then be established. Every culture sees the same phenomenon through the filter of its own paradigm. However, the Bible presents us with a reality that spans all civilizations, in which the angels of God are here on earth, and their influence is unmistakable. The UFO phenomenon is evidence of their presence. Throughout the ages, Satan has worn the cloak of many disguises, and has brought entire civilizations under his worldview, reinventing himself each time, always as a higher entity, a god. Today, he has turned himself into a myth, fictionalized history, and has been rewriting it for us.
Scripture cuts through his disguises and reveals their evil strategy. Will you recognize the truth? Will the world, at Satan's command, take up arms against God as prophesied? At this turning point in our history, as the fallen angels present themselves as the saviors of mankind, will you be seduced? Next question uh, is when aliens interact with humans, they bring a message for mankind. Mm -hmm. Chuck Missler talks about in his book how whenever these guys show up, they don't have a cure for cancer, they, don't, they can't solve all of these different problems with humanity, they don't bring superior scientific technology or anything, they want to talk about what? They talk about... Um, who God is as a life force, as a force. They talk about many times, as I just mentioned, that, that they, the aliens, uh, genetically manipulated us. Um, they talk about that they have a holographic film of the crucifixion, which is in, which will be actually in, in Nephilim 3. I'm working on that now. That's part of the hook of Nephilim 3. In, Nef in, in the book, the first book, Nephilim, it, it talks about uh, the protagonist is in Area 51, and he's deep underground in this secret room, which really, has its basis of that is in Bob Lazar's story, where apparently, Bob Lazar, for those of you who don't know, quick update is that it's a man who allegedly, supposedly worked at Area 51 and handled and saw UFO craft and handled the, the element um, that is responsible for making the crash fly. Now, whether that's true or not, who knows? Uh, there's another UFO guy, Stanton Friedman, who doesn't believe a word of it. I say that to say that um, uh, uh, that he talked about, Bob Lazar talked about uh, a room in which he would spend no more than 20 or 30 minutes and in that room were a series of documents and they were unlike anything he'd ever seen. They were almost like as he turned the page it would be like cellophane but you would actually see three dimensional uh, pictures and it was like it was, it was the alien bible, it was alien literature talking about, you know, they had pictures of like ancient civilizations and how they had come here and how they had genetically manipulated man and, and, um, and all this stuff. And, and it's always the same thing. Art McKenzie, the, the protagonist in Nephilim, poses the question to one of the skeptics in, in book one and, and says to him, you know, I echo your words, why come a gazillion miles to tell us that Jesus really wasn't the Christ mm -hmm. and that he really wasn't the Son of God and that the work of the cross was unnecessary, which is what they tell us. Why not give us the cure to cancer or, or end world hunger or, or start global peace, something, do something destructive. Why attack that? And, you know, as um, all my research in the occult and in cults in general, there's, there's always two, two trademarks of a cult and one is they deny the deity of Christ and the second one is they deny the work of the cross always they always go after those two things well he wasn't really God he was just another he was a good man he was a guru we genetically made him he was a walk-in you know we inhabited Jesus's body the crucifixion really wasn't necessary we helped in the resurrection and that's when you get into this stuff that's what they talk about I mean that's that's not my that's not, I'm not saying this I'm just repeating what people have had encounters with aliens this is the stuff that they bring back and tell us so as Christians our antennas should be up flags should be on the play whistles should be blown call a timeout and say wait a minute what does Paul say anyone who brings us another gospel let them be anathema let them be cursed and that's another gospel, isn't it? Saying that Jesus, you know, is not the Son of God, that he wasn't here in the flesh, and that the work of the cross really didn't matter, which is everything. The work of the cross is everything. Incidentally, in the 1940s, when they conducted Gallup polls, um, 
they had sections on UFOs, what is a UFO, and it was usually categorised as secret American technology or secret technology from another country or something like that. There was never a category that can said it was, you know, races from uh, another planet. But by the 1950s there was, and you can almost find on a graph that it, the amount of people that now believe that there is life elsewhere in the universe has increased by about 10% per decade. And what's happening is our culture is changing as a result of two things. Evolution, particularly cosmic evolution if you want to call it that, and science fiction. In fact, the Gallup polls in the recent years show that in most Western countries, between 70 to 80 percent of the general population believe that there is extraterrestrial life somewhere out there. July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. They look something like a, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear. I think it's time to open the books uh, on, on uh, questions that have remained in the dark, on the, on the question of, of government investigations of, of UFOs. It's time to find out what, what the truth really is that's out there. Uh, we ought to do it really because it's right. We ought to do it because the American people, quite frankly, can handle the truth. And we ought to do it because it's the law. Major sighting here on the 13th of March. Weird happenings in the skies over Phoenix recently. And no one seems to be able to explain what it was. And now, suddenly six amber orbs in a row, totally equidistant from each other, a massive span across, pop up. People say they saw strange lights. Like there is a strange bright light seen over the skies of Arizona. Gets a lot of people wondering what the heck. There's going to be a time where they're not going to be able to hide it anymore. The availability of witnesses is extraordinary. There are another 10,000 Arizonans who saw the same thing. Eyewitnesses same who saw it say it's like nothing they've ever seen before. Many investigators call it the largest sighting ever, lasting the longest amount of time seen by the largest number of people. The data speaks for itself. Plus, I have photographs that cannot be explained or denied. Last night, shortly after 8 p.m., hundreds, maybe thousands of Arizonans reported seeing a triangular-shaped object with three to thousands of people saw more than stars in the night sky. The mystery remains unsolved and controversial. The people who saw the lights will say the lights were orange. They were bright and they were big and they were like nothing they've ever seen before. And there's been no official explanation. The bigger question is not, is there a phenomenon, but what is this phenomenon? I'm learning that this is happening worldwide. What's going on here? What is this? Mexican Air Force pilots capturing on videotape what are said to be 11, count them, 11 UFOs. Unidentified flying objects. They are officially there. Bright objects, some sharp points of light moving quickly across the sky. The tape called historic by some. Members of the Mexican Defense Department saying it's the first time UFOs have had the backing of any country's armed forces. Now a group of activists calling on the United States government to end what it says is an embargo on the truth about extraterrestrial life. What is that thing on your screen? With us now from Washington is Stephen Bassett, founder and executive director of the Extraterrestrial Phenomena, uh, Phenomena Political Action Committee. Last time he was here, he was running for Congress, was un unsuccessful in that venture. But I will ask you today, sir, the Mexican government, the Mexican military says, hey, we took these pictures, these are UFOs. Um, what was that, you know? This is significant for two reasons. Uh, 
Shepard. Uh, one, this is released by, by the Defense Ministry of Mexico. This is a message being sent to the United States government that uh, Mexico and many other governments are losing patience with our government's intransigence in ending this embargo. Uh, other messages have been sent by France in uh, 1999 with the Cometa report and by the United Kingdom when they released a substantial number of documents regarding the Bentwaters case in 2000. Many countries know about the extraterrestrial presence, but they deferred to the United States with, uh, with regard to the timing of when disclosure would take place. But they're simply losing patience. How do we know this, by the way? Well, we know it by paying attention. I've been following this now for 10 years. We call it the politics of disclosure, the disclosure process. Hundreds of government witnesses in this country have come forward, uh, and other governments are putting pressure on our government. The media hasn't covered it thoroughly enough, Shepard. If it did, it would learn about some of the things I'm mentioning here, and also learn about thousands of other videos and photographs that have been taken over Mexico by Mexican citizens there's, there's absolutely no question about that and his number thousands is accurate since 1991 thousands of pictures and videotapes of discs but never anything like this taken by such sophisticated cameras on board military vehicles oh there's been plenty of but not of, not as clear and widespread as this and government confirmed in this way I'm just saying that these are unusual in oh no way. it's happened many times before but this is the first time it's been released believe me there is evidence like this in the archives of every major first world government in the country but they release this publicly in a news conference uh, in mexico city that's the difference studies have been done that quote clearly indicate the likelihood of an extraterrestrial explanation but there are people sitting out there i'm hoping there are millions of people watching at the moment who are saying this is nutty why you know why why do we even talk about such things the polls show otherwise shepherd uh cnn time Reuters polls last 10 years consistently 50 percent of all americans believe the extraterrestrial explanation accounts for these sightings up to as many as 90 percent of americans believe the government is outright lying uh the polls are unambiguous year after year the same thing in fact if you could talk anonymously to people even in congress probably 50 percent of members of congress already confirmed convinced that the extraterrestrial presence explains this phenomena disclosure is at hand it is very close and the american people need to prepare themselves very soon for an announcement from our government that there is in fact an extraterrestrial presence engaging this planet and the human race all right well there you have it perhaps we need some outside universal threat I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world.